Thank you, Don. Let's now have Guy Aoki to get, share some more memories with us. Or as Casey would say, Guy Aoki. <laughs> I'd like to thank Carrie and Mike and Julie for allowing me to speak. This is truly an honor. January 1975, I was in the seventh grade in Hilo, Hawaii, going through the most confusing time of my life, adolescence. Junior high seemed like a colder world, and every other day while waiting for the bus home, somebody would come up to me trying to pick a fight and call me Jap or Nip. I longed for the good old days where life seemed simpler and when I felt protected. And when I hear these old songs, they revive such vivid memories of more innocent days, but I hadn't paid attention to what those songs were. So in order to catch up, to find out what I've been missing and what was going on now, I vowed to start listening to American Top 40 for three hours a week. I wrote down number 40 all the way to number one, how much the song went up, how much the song went down, where it peaked on the chart, and any trivia tidbit that Casey would, would offer. And eventually I became an expert on pop music where you could tell me any song from the late 60s on, and I would tell you who sang it, where it peaked on the chart, who wrote it, who produced it, probably who arranged it, the record company, and the distributor. Um, in 1983, like many people before me, I sent a trivia question to American Top 40, but I also sent the answer. And um, they, they ran it, and I got credit. It was, who holds the record for singing lead with the most groups that made the Top 40? And I found this guy who did five. Don Bustani tracked me down in my dorm at Occidental College and offered me a job. First as a production assistant, then as a researcher, and then as a mixing producer. And while I was there from 84 to 88, I learned a lot about how to write about music. I began to write for magazines. I went on to become a reporter for the Los Angeles Times. And for 17 years, I wrote my own countdown shows for Dick Clark, Countdown America, and the US Music Survey. None of this would have happened without Casey Kasem and Don Bustani. And I thank you, Don, so much for that. Casey, yeah. Don deserves a lot of credit. Don is the unsung hero in all of this. He wrote and co-created American Top 40 and produced it and gave us this American institution. And I love you, Don. Thank you. Casey had the best voice on the entire planet. Casey was to radio what Karen Carpenter was to singing. They both had this unique, intimate voice that connected with listeners, and there was no one else like them. He was a perfectionist. He reread every sentence until he found the right emphasis for the right syllable. And that's why today on the Facebook page, American Top 40, the 70s, you find such loyal and devoted fans. Not an hour goes by where someone doesn't post something about AT40, including what countdown is going to be rebroadcast that week on, weekend on Sirius XM or on local stations. 25, 30, 40, 44 years after it started, people can't get enough of listening to those old shows over and over again. And many of those fans are serious about mounting a campaign to get Casey Kasem into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And I think it's a good idea. I think we should join that campaign. Even more rewarding working with Casey was with civil rights and media issues. I was a member of NCRR, National Coalition for Redress and Reparations. That was the volunteer group that lobbied Congress to pass the bill that would get the government to apologize for putting 120,000 loyal Japanese Americans in concentration camps during World War II. The bill paid $20,000 per survivor. In 1991, I got Casey to speak at the annual Day of Remembrance program sponsored by NCRR. It was, the first, it was the start of the first Gulf War, and Arab Americans were being treated suspiciously, just as Japanese Americans had been 50 years before. Casey pointed out the positive contributions of Arab Americans, and he united our two communities by asserting that they weren't talking about interning Arab Americans because of the victory Japanese Americans had had. In 1993, Casey and Don supported the organization I founded, MANA, Media Action Network, for Asian Americans, which is the only Asian American media watchdog group around. They came out for the press conference and the protest for the latest Yellow Peril stereotype, the movie Rising Sun, starring Sean Connery and Wesley Snipes. 
Casey said, movies like Rising Sun put baseball bats into the hands of bigots. In 1995, Mana had come to an impasse with the radio station KKBT, The Beat. Whenever an Asian American was in the news, they'd mimic them, but with fake, thick Asian accents, perpetuating the notion that Asian Americans are these foreign, foreigners that you can just dismiss and laugh at. So after a year and a half of this, we went after their advertisers, and it made them furious. John London ridiculed us for asserting that Asian Americans had faced oppression in this country. He said, we didn't know the meaning of the word. I sent a tape of the broadcast to Casey. He called me back and he said, Guy, this man is ignorant. Asian Americans haven't suffered in this country. What about the internment camps? What about the 142nd Regimental Combat Team, which became the most decorated military U.S. unit in history, because they tried so hard to prove their loyalty. He went on and on. He said, we have to educate him. Not only was Casey at the protest that Saturday, he was the first person on the picket line. He got there even before I did. We got on the news, and on Monday, John London and company were raging mad. They went after Casey, they had someone imitate him in a skit, and it got pretty disgusting. I called him up and I said, Casey, I am so sorry. I didn't expect him to go this far. And I'll never forget the reaction he gave me because this is the kind of man he was. He said, oh, don't apologize. No, don't apologize, guy. This is good for your cause. People are talking about it now. No, don't apologize. I've been called worse. If anything, it just shows you the kind of man he is that he'd stoop this low. Most celebrities would say, no, I'm, I'm busy that weekend. Let me sign your petition. Nowadays, it would be, yeah, let me, uh, let me join your hashtag campaign. Not Casey. He was always there for a righteous cause, even if it hurt him professionally. He even, he even narrated our video on the history of our organization twice. And he was such a humanitarian who cared deeply. I'm upset that the press has overlooked the fact that he co-hosted the Jerry Lewis Muscular Dystrophy Telethon for close to 20 years. I, don't, I can't even find it on, when I Google it. That's how much they're not, they're not talking about it. But I remember a few years ago, Casey was co-hosting the LA portion, and it was the final hour. They ran a video package of another child that was suffering from MS. They came back to Casey, and he was in tears. And as he made his final plea, he cried through it. He said, we've got to help these kids. We've got to end this horrible disease. Please, please, call the number at the bottom of your screen. Please make a contribution. This is the kind of man we lost. There'll never be someone like him again. Looking back on it now, it seems like a fairy tale. The man who was my idol became my coworker, my colleague, my collaborator, someone who even called me his good friend. It's hard to believe, and yet it happened. And he made dreams come true that I hadn't even imagined. I'm one of the fans of American Top 40 who got lucky. Casey, thank you for inspiring me and millions like me with your voice, your style, your enthusiasm, your passion, your genius. Thank you for standing up for so many important causes for so many different people. You left this world a much better place. Thank you, Guy.